Hi, how you doing? I hope you're really well. I am Ella Feingold, and thank you for checking out this video. A little disclaimer, I am a Ravel scholar and I've been studying his orchestrations for many, many years. I'm definitely new to talking about it, so I just ask for your patience as I sort of find authenticity and get more comfortable explaining some of these things. They're unscripted, but I think there's a lot of um, interesting things to check out. So, thank you. Let's get started. So this is Kaddish from Du Melodie Brec. This is the orchestral version. The piano vocal version is known a lot more. So this is the original part here I downloaded from IMSLP. This is the orchestral version that I re-engraved just so you guys could see it a little bit cleaner. There's only one copy that I know of uh, online at least and the scan is atrocious. So let's, um, let's get started. Try not to look over here. Don't cheat. So let's just look at the piano part for a moment and kind of break it down. So we have figuration, we have something that starts low, something that goes high. When it gets up high, we have something underneath to add more resonance. And we have an accent here. So we know that he wants something articulated on the bottom, something articulated at the top. The original piano version, I have to flip back, but I believe it's pianissimo or piano. So we also know that he wants it quiet. Okay, so what's he going to do? So if you watch the last video, you know with some of his techniques, at the very least, he's gonna make a meal out of this. You know, he's gonna, he's gonna do three or four things. There's no way he's gonna take this and be literal and copy and, copy and paste it somewhere. Copy and paste. Um, he's just not gonna do that because that's not how Raphael rolls. So he transfers the harp part, the piano part, into the harp over here. Four notes in each hand because harpists, believe it or not, don't play with five fingers. Um, they use four fingers. So that's the main thing that he wants you to hear is the harp. Perfect. Some orchestrators might just stop there and plunk some strings right here and call it a day and go, yay, I orchestrated this. And Ravel, if you were studying with him, would tell you that's instrumented rather than orchestrated. And again, instrumentation is giving the effect of the piano pedals, the sustain pedal. It's, it's building a mist around the sound. Um, if you know Ma Mère Loire and you know the introduction, he has a flute up high and he has a muted horn with it. So he's fooling the listener and he's building a mist around the sound by putting a mute in the horn, but not just stopping there, but putting viola um, pizzicati with mutes on. So it's just color and articulation. And um, those were a lot of the things that Ravel strived for. I'll, I'll have to find a quote, but he actually talked about this aesthetic of deception and fooling the listener. He actually talked about seducing the listener and, and leading them astray. And so by putting just little pizzicati plucks under the horn, it fools your ear. It makes you think you're hearing something else rather than say just a horn and an open horn. So I'm getting off topic, but it's important to know what Ravel's striving for and what his aesthetics are, what he values. And I think that if you're at least trying to orchestrate like him, if you know his values, then you'll look to do certain things in the music. We know that he loves transparency. We know he likes pure colors. He's not very... I don't, I don't know if German's the right word to say, but he's not, he's not Wagner. He's not doubling things and trying to do a mass. He wants transparency. He wants clarity. 
he's he's like a small canvas with tons and tons of brush strokes and so when you know those things that there's a little bit of trickery in his orchestration and transparency and wanting to quote bathe the music in sonorous fluid i think those three things are huge pillars to better understand um what he's after so when you're making these decisions um they're just i don't know little little light posts to guide you so let's get started <laughs> five minutes later. So this is going upwards. Okay, we put this into the harp. Fine. We look here and we see that he has an attack on the downbeat. So who can add attack to the harp without it overwhelming the harp, without it detracting too much? And his answer is a double stop pizzicato in the cello and a viola. So he's got that on the bottom. So he has attack on the bottom. He wants you to hear and feel the bottom. And then when you get up to the top, he's carefully orchestrated some triple stops uh, divided between the first and the second violins. And if you notice, there's a strum on the pizzicato triple stops. So we could look at this a lot of different ways. We could say he wants a guitar strum-like effect, mandolin strum-like effect. We could say that he wants it to be neither of those things and it's just the top of the harp. And that, that's his version of kind of becoming the top of the harp. We could say that it's none of those things and that he simply just wants to recreate the attack of the piano. It could be all of those things. But I think it's important to question every marking on the page. I don't trust that anything is just there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially with Ravel. Nothing is just there by chance. I mean, he just thought about everything. I can just picture him, you know, in his fancy suit with the window open, you know, Le Belvedere just going, oh, you know, should I have them roll the chord and strum it? Should it be non divisi So, anyways. So that's what's at the top of the harp. Okay, so we have the harp as the main thing. We have some attack at the bottom. We have attack at the top. And now we have woodwinds and brass um, providing resonance to the top to make this attack longer. And I put this in concert because I just thought it's easier for some of those that are not very comfortable reading and transposed, although you should. Um, so he's just voicing the chord low to high from horns, bassoon, two oboes, and a flute. You'll notice that he has a flute harmonic because he's, you know, orchestrating the dynamics, so to speak. It's pianissimo, so why not be a harmonic? It's more transparent, a little more pale. Maybe he doesn't want it detracting from the G here. Um, and he has the bassoon in a high register and it just blends really well with these chords. You could have even done fiber mutes in the horns to make it a little bit more woodwind-like. Um, he does not have the clarinets in here because he's saving that color um, for something that's coming up, which is just great orchestration like Mozart. Just save your colors, don't, don't give it all away. Okay. The last thing that he does is he has what I talked about in the video the other day, sonorous fluid, fluid sonore. So he chose to divide the double basses um, and both of them are playing on their G string and they're playing natural harmonics. And what they're doing, they, because this is basses, you know, this sounds down an octave. So this sonorous fluid here is actually this G right here in the harp, and this bottom G. It's the perfect color to stay in the background of the harp and not get in the way. And he's just chosen all of his colors just so beautifully and wisely and colorfully. It's just, it's masterful. Um, it's just absolutely masterful what he does and how much of a meal he makes out of something. 
So this is one of so, so many techniques and I'm happy to talk about more of them. Uh, sorry if I rambled a little bit in this video. Sometimes I get a little nervous, you know. So anyways, uh, if anyone has any questions on anything, definitely let me know. The orchestral versions out there, I don't have a particular favorite version. There just aren't a lot of them out there. I think I've only seen maybe two or three of the orchestral version. So yeah, we've got the main thing. We've got some attack. We've got sonorous fluid and we've got another thing being the woodwind. So four things out of one thing. I mean, I'm speaking very simply here, but I, th I think you get the gist. You could almost say when you're orchestrating one thing, so to speak, I need to find at least three or four things. A main thing, some fluid, something to maybe attack, and touche, something, some, some little touches here and there. And that's like a Revelian recipe. So anyways, thanks again for watching and I hope everyone has a wonderful day or evening wherever you are. Thank you so much. Okay.